I want to spend the whole sermon today on just one word. Uh, it, is a, it is a really big word, so it, it's big enough to fill a whole sermon. But it's also a really important word, especially as we continue with the series of asking this question, but why? Why exactly did Jesus have to die? I mean, we know the simple and profound and right answer, Christ died for our sins. Yes, absolutely. But why? Why did God in his plan to rescue the world from its sinfulness, why did he have to come to earth in the form of a man? Uh, why did he have to suffer? And why did he have to die? And in particular, as we journey towards Easter and this crucifixion event, uh, we want to be asking questions. Why was that death so brutal? Why was it necessary for all of the, the mockery, for the spitting, for the physical beatings, for the torment? for the 39 lashes with that cruel whip? Why was it necessary for Jesus to labor and stagger and carry that cross? Why was it necessary that he would hang nailed to this cross? Uh, why, why couldn't he just have died maybe by uh, decapitation, something like that, which is uh, true, still bad, but why this slow, drawn-out, long death? The crucifixion event is so central to, us, to the story of Christianity, but why was it like that? And after today, you will understand exactly why. So last week, we answered that to some extent by looking at how we would value or evaluate love. And one of the reasons that, we, that, one of the ways that we would do that is to look at the magnitude or the extent to which someone would be willing to sacrifice for somebody else. So part of the reason why the crucifixion was so brutal was God demonstrating, showing us just how much he loves us. But there's a lot more to this crucifixion event. And most of that resides in the this one word. So you ready? Look at this one word. So let's read together. We're reading from Romans chapter 3, verse 21 to 26. And it says, But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So there's, there's a few big words in there, some important words, which we'll get to at some point. Words like justified, Words like redemption, big, beautiful words. But the word that will most fully answer the question about why the crucifixion of Jesus was so brutal is the word propitiation. So man, that's a really good word to learn. Um, you, you can throw that around at dinner parties, guaranteed. Uh, no one will know what it means, and you'll sound super smart. So you're, you're welcome. Propitiation. A, a lot of you will have translations maybe in front of you that won't exactly use that word. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, because granted, it, it's not a common word that we use, and it's really, it's really, really big. But I've got to tell you, one of the reasons that I like the translation that I'm using is because it includes this word. And I think once you know what this word means, you're going to want to see it there too. So I want to give you a simple definition and then give you uh, some, explain it to you in, in context. Propitiation means to absorb the wrath or anger 
of God. So when the Bible says that God put forward Jesus as a propitiation for our sins, what it means is this, that Jesus, by taking our sin and the sin of the world on his shoulders, diverts the wrath of God towards sin, diverts it from us to him. He then absorbs it, thereby releasing us from having to absorb the divine wrath of God. Can I say that again? Jesus, by taking our sin and the sin of the world on his shoulders, diverts the divine wrath or anger of God, diverts it from us toward him, and he then absorbs it, rescuing us from needing to endure the divine wrath of God. So I hope you can see why it's such a big, beautiful, important word. Maybe also why you won't want to use that at a dinner party. To understand this a little bit more fully, I've got to get into the spirit of the series, which is to ask, but, but why? I mean, there's lots of questions around this, uh, but perhaps the most important one, if we can understand this, is, but why? Does God get angry at sin? We we learned last week how he loves us. Like if he loves us, couldn't God just kind of like just let it go? And perhaps we also want to answer a related question. Why did Jesus like have to absorb it in that way? So let's go there. We're going to answer those two questions. And then I'm going to make a surprising application, uh, particularly around what we're going through in this unprecedented time in our history. So what is the wrath of God? I think one of the reasons why translations kind of shy away from this big word propitiation is because at the center of it is this word wrath, the wrath of God, which is granted not a very palatable concept. And to kind of describe to you the reality of God's anger at sin. I mean, I could point to hundreds of scriptures, but what I want to do is I want to uh, show it to you conceptually. So, so we're going to have a little bit of a thought experiment here, right? So it, it's not a perfect one, uh, but it really helped me as I struggled with this. So just imagine this scenario with me, this thought experiment. So imagine we're kind of living and we get news of a murderer that, uh, that is kind of walking around the streets and it's kind of this, I'm, you know, let's make it a pretty hectic story. A murderer is murdered, you know, just people, babies, I mean, I don't know, pets. They're just put in the picture, this kind of murderer that's walking loose. And you might have seen news of it on TV and you see a picture of this guy. And now let's say you're walking down the street um, to the shops because you're only allowed to go to the shops at this time. You're walking down the street uh, and you see this guy walking towards you, coming the other way, and you recognize him. You're like, hey, that's the guy. This is, this is the murderer. This is the guy that has killed like women and, and children. And as you're walking towards him, as he's walking toward you, the thought experiment is this. What do you feel inside at that moment? Okay, putting aside that you may feel a little bit scared uh, and putting aside that you may like want to call the police, just like what's kind of rising up in, inside of you? What do you feel when you see him, this guy that's done these things? You're going to experience a degree of anger, aren't you? Like this is the guy. Okay, that's part one of the thought experiment. Here's part two. So now imagine another murderer. There's two now. And imagine another murderer is walking down the road, and he's done stuff like this as well. And as he's walking to the shops, he sees coming towards him the same guy, the guy on TV. And so the murderer spots this other murderer walking towards him. He's like, hey, this is the guy. I've heard about him, what he's done. How is he going to feel when he sees this guy walking towards him? I mean, granted, he's not going to be scared, probably, and he's not going to call the police. 
will he, the murderer, be angry at seeing this other murderer walk towards him? What do you think? I don't think so. I don't think he's going to experience that, that same degree of anger. This is the murderer. Why? Because he's done the same kinds of things. Whereas you and I, hopefully, haven't murdered anybody. We haven't done those things. So why, why is there this difference in this experience of anger between you and I who haven't done these things and, and another murderer who has done them? Well, the difference is really this. Because we haven't done it, in, in a sense, we're righteous. And I want to say, of course, I mean, in this illustration, we're not perfectly righteous. But in this sense, when it comes to murder, we are righteous. And so, therefore, what we're experiencing is righteous anger. And righteous anger is the wrath of God. It is therefore something, the wrath of God is something that emanates from him by virtue of the fact that this is who God is. He's completely righteous. He's completely holy. God does not sit there deciding in a moment, hey, here's some sinfulness, I better act appropriately in anger. God doesn't decide to be angry or wrathful at sin, it emanates from who he is. For example, as a parent, uh, you know, Benjamin might, might do something naughty, not that he would because he is a perfect child, uh, but he might do something naughty hypothetically, and I might think, okay, this is a dead moment. I need to act on this. I need to be angry, even though a lot of the time, I think it's kind of funny, but like I've got to like cover that and like pretend and, and, and act because that's how I'm supposed to act. That's not the anger of God. He doesn't, he doesn't decide to do it. His divine wrath or righteous anger emanates purely from who he is. He's a holy God and we're not. It's kind of like if you think about wind and where does wind come from? It's actually quite a strange thing. The wind comes from where there's a high pressure system and then a low pressure system. You just get this movement of air. That's wind. And when the high pressure system of God's holiness meets with a low pressure system of our unholiness, of our sinfulness, there will be a divine hurricane of God's anger unleashed at sin. So that's kind of really heavy for Sunday. So I said to you last week, I hope you got your bunny slippers on. But here's the good news. God put forward Jesus. So God, he's doing this. Remember last week, God's doing this. The one who is angry at sin. God puts forward Jesus himself. God put forward Jesus as the propitiation, as the one to absorb the divine anger of God. God put forward Jesus as the propitiation by his blood for us. And as we saw last week, not because we deserved it in any way, but simply because he loves us. So Jesus, having taken our sin and the sin of the world on his shoulders, this crucifixion event, this is why it's so brutal. Because as he takes the sin of the world on his shoulders and diverts this divine wrath of God, and as that's unleashed upon him, absorbs it, rescuing us from needing to one day absorb it. That's why the crucifixion event is the way that it was. So our kind of second question was, well, why, why this absorbing idea? Why couldn't God just kind of have put it aside? And I think you can already see that because it emanates from who he is, God can't just cancel wrath because he'd have to cancel who he is as a holy God. So I think we can already see that, but I want to dig into this a little bit deeper because I want to show you the, the fact 
fact that it has been absorbed, that Jesus absorbed past tense, it means that it has been dealt with once and for all. And I really want you to see that. Because if it had been canceled, it might, you know, it might have been postponed, you might still be worrying, or maybe one day. So to do that, to convince you of that, how Jesus absorbed it, I want to point you to another verse, uh, an Easter Thursday verse. This is Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Matthew 26, we read the story. Then Jesus went with them, the disciples, to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And then he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here, watch with me. And going a little further, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, my father, if it be possible, let this cup Pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. So what does Jesus mean when he says, let this cup pass? So Jesus is referring to a very common Old Testament kind of image where all over the Old Testament you read of how God was pouring out his cup of wrath on Israel and on her enemies. For example, Isaiah 51 verse 17. Wake yourself, wake yourself, stand up, O Jerusalem, you who have drunk from the hand of the Lord the cup of his wrath, who have drunk to the dregs, the bowl, the cup of staggering. So when Jesus prays, Father, remove this cup from me, when he's sorrowful, even to death, he's not chickening out because of the pain that he knows he's going to endure. I mean, martyrs face death like this. What Jesus knows is he is about to drink the cup of God's wrath for all sin. And he will drink it to the dregs and he will stagger because of it so you know after the soldiers come and they arrest Jesus Peter in, in a moment of boldness I mean, he has his moments but in a moment of boldness takes out his sword and remember he lashes out at that one soldier and cuts his ear off and Jesus says to Peter hey put your sword into its sheath shall I not drink the cup that the father has given me which just, by the way, gives communion a whole new meaning because when we take that cup, we remember that it is no longer a cup of God's wrath because Jesus drank it. It is finished. So what could this possibly mean for us today? I mean, right now, kind of in this, in this moment we're in, in lockdown. So, I mean, there's a few things I could say, and I'm, I'm going to say some of them later. But for today, I just want to say two things. And these two things rest on just understanding something about sickness. We know as Christians that the existence of sickness is because of sin. Now, I'm not saying that anyone who gets sick, that that's evidence of any particular sin in their life. What I'm saying is sickness did not exist before the fall of mankind. Sickness did not exist in the world where there was no sin. And one day in eternity where there is no sin, there will be no sickness either and no death. Sickness and death and struggle in so many ways exists as, a, as an effect of Sin. So, if we know that sickness comes originally from sin, and if we know today that Jesus bore the weight of sin and all of its effects, then we know two things. We know, firstly, that Jesus has dealt with this already, completely. 
So we know that we're going to get through this. We're going to get through COVID-19 as, as a country. We'll get through this. I was driving to work. There's a sign, billboard sign on the side with the LED lights, and it says, COVID-19, South Africa, let's do this. We can get through this. And I'm like, amen. We will get through this, but we will not get through this because of our, our plans. And I want to say the plans that government's put in place, we believe is the common grace of God and wisdom that is given to them. And we, and, and we appreciate that and respect that. But we won't get through this primarily because of the plans. We will get through this because we know as Christians with certainty that Jesus has drunk that cup. He's carried the weight of sin itself, not just the effects, the cause. He has drunk it. He has said it is finished. There is a finality here. There is a comprehensiveness to this. We know that it has been dealt with. And while we are still living right now in this fallen world and the kingdom of God is with us and slowly expanding and one day Jesus will come again and then everything will be perfect. But we know we have dealt with this. We will get through this despite I know how difficult it's still going to get. In other words, we have hope. But it's not hope that just rests on plans. Again, I want to say these plans are good and we abide by them. But it's a hope that rests on something far deeper than that. And it's not just wishful thinking either. Sometimes hope is just like naive optimism. This is a hope that rests on a completed, finished work that dealt with the cause of every disastrous thing that we see in the world. So we have hope. We know we're going to get through this. And if we know that Jesus drank this cup, absorbed the weight of sin, then, then it means also this. Secondly, then we know that he feels the weight of our struggle. That's kind of this picture we see in the garden of Jesus as he's facing drinking this cup and as he endures this diversion of wrath from us to him. Jesus feels the weight of every disastrous effect of sin in a way that we will never have to thank God. But he feels it. He knows. He's not just up there sympathizing with us from a distance, going, oh, shame, guys, down there. It's really tough, man. You know, don't worry, like, we'll get through this. No, no. He has come to it and he has experienced experienced the weight of all of our anxiety. That's what he expressed in the garden. He's experienced all of our affliction, our trouble, our uncertainty, our fear, our panic, job loss, what that feels like. He knows what it's like for your world to come suffocating around you. He's felt that. He knows it. He knows what it's like. He's felt it because he faced it and he endured it and he dealt with it and he said, it is finished. And so therefore you can know that even right now, days away from when I'm saying this, I, I trust and I know that right now you can know that Jesus is beside you with his arms kind of extending around you, loving you, telling you that it is finished and it's going to be okay. And that's not wishful thinking because he has endured it and it is finished. So I want to pray for us. And I want to pray just from our passage. And so just kind of as you're entering into a space of prayer, I want you to just hear and, and see another word that comes up three times in this passage. 
a, a word that describes, a really important word. It's not a big word, it's a really small word, but a really important word because it describes how you can experience this, how you can know this to be sure for you. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and prophets bore witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. So no distinction. We've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness. In his divine forbearance, he had passed over sin, but it was to show his righteousness at this present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Heavenly Father, as we gather before you, I pray that that through your spirit that is present across time and across space and in different places, that you will have just taken all of these words, Holy Spirit, and just deposited the reality in our hearts, if not our minds, this understanding of your very nature as a holy God and who we are, all, all of us, fallen short, all of us deserving of this divine hurricane, we pause and just think about those words justified made righteous all of a sudden redeemed rescued and having had your anger diverted away from us Holy Spirit would you just within us just create a a wellspring a fountain a, a tangible experience of that that produces joy and peace in other words I pray that you would deposit faith within everybody listening watching this seeds of faith increase our faith especially at this time when we're not sure what's going on but we know that the disastrous consequences of everything around us is because of the sinfulness of man and we are reminded of how you've dealt with that Oh, Jesus, would you breathe your peace on us? Walk with us hand in hand through this human catastrophe. And for those that are still going to suffer, we pray for just miraculous sense of your peace upon them even as they start to experience suffering. With that sense of your, you walking with them, your arms around them saying, I've got you. All those worried saying, I've got you. We know that those words are true. You experience this. You know, and you love us. We thank you, and we trust you. Amen.